And so, Father, we can trust you. We can lean into you as we have concern and anxiety. Father, we can pray. We can intercede for those loved ones and, and people like them. Right? And, Father, we have and we will and we'll continue to. And, Father, we can do more than that. Well, I know we have two of our church members already are, are down uh, assisting the victims in, in Hurricane Harvey and, and more that are prepared to go, Lord. We'll get to when those opportunities are when they're able to go. Uh, we thank you for that, Lord. We bow our knees and we are concerned. Our hearts go out. And we ask, Lord, that you not only be with them, but be with us. Father, we, we don't know what our tomorrow will hold, individually or collectively. And so we come to you, Father, in this act of worship. We come to bow down before you. We come to exalt you, to lift up your name, to worship you, Father. And we thank you for that privilege. We thank you for our brothers and sisters. For this little church you've given us, Father, in this part of your world, to be a lighthouse, Father, to proclaim the gospel, Lord, to live as faithful followers of Christ, so that others might get a glimpse, they might see this wonderful way that we have found. And Father, that Christ may continue to draw people to us, Lord, and to all of the Bible-believing churches, Lord, that they might find what we have found. And Lord, in this hour, we dedicate to you, we come to present ourselves before you, we're conscious that really, Lord, you are the audience, and we are performing for you. We come to bow, worship, honor, adore you, Lord, to seek your face while it may be found. And God, as we come, we need your help. May your Holy Spirit even help us. Some may be struggling for one thing or another. There may be hearts that are, that are distracted this morning. We need your Holy Spirit to give us strength to even worship. To listen to your word, Lord, to open your mind and give it a chance to speak to our hearts in a powerful, supernatural way that only you can do, Lord. And for that, we look to those ends we ask. In the wonderful and the sweet name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, if you're also glad you're here, if you're visiting with us, there are cards in the chair in front of you. If you'd like to let us know you're here, we'd love to have that. We can minister to you in any way. Feel free to communicate. But now, why don't we just stand?
Well, amen. Thank you, Derek and orchestra and all of you great singers out there and all of you lousy singers out there. Thank you for being bold and brave and just belting it out for the Lord. He said, make a joyful noise, and that, that qualifies all of us to sing. Maybe not in the choir, maybe not solos, but uh, no. Actually, I've been told you can even join the choir with a lousy voice, and they'll work on you. They'll help you out. I saw one of my class members up there that I didn't know belonged up there just a minute ago. It's good to see you this morning, church. Did I sell you out, Mel? Sorry. Did I identify you, brother? Sorry. You know, two weeks ago, we picked up our New Testaments, we picked up our Bibles, and we found that letter, that first letter that Paul wrote to Timothy. Uh, It's a personal letter, just written to Timothy, but it's also a job letter, because when Paul left to go to Macedonia, he left Timothy in Ephesus and and gave him some directions. And that's the part of this letter that we read. We know from the first chapter that the Apostle Paul told Timothy that there were some heretics in that church. Two men by name, Hymenaeus uh, and the other guy. Uh, I've started it now, I've got to finish it. Uh, Right there in verse... uh, 12. It's right there. What's what's right... uh, uh, Alexander, who said, is that you, Sue? Thank you, Sue. One of my Sunday school class members helping out the poor old guy. Uh, yeah, that's right, Hymenius and Alexander. Th- these guys are teaching fables. They're, they're teaching things they don't even know what they're talking about, and it's causing division in the church. And Paul says, Timothy, this has got to stop. You've got to deal with these guys. You know, This is not helpful in the body of Christ. And then he, P- Paul also mentions his own commitment and his own walk with the Lord. So it's this kind of wonderful uh, moving back and forth between encouraging young Timothy in the faith in a tough situation and at the same same time strengthening him by what God's done in Paul's life. And Paul says, you know, the reason why God saved this old blasphemer, this old old, uh, persecutor of God's people was to be an example so they'd give hope to everybody. Man, it doesn't matter what you've done. doesn't matter how lousy you are. doesn't matter how you've mistreated God. There's place for you in the kingdom. If Paul was saved by God, he can save anybody. And he's willing and ready to save anyone, <clears throat> excuse me, no matter what they have done. But now, coming to chapter 2, Paul's thinking about prayer, the role of prayer in the life of the church, and how that's going to also be huge for Timothy. So if you have your Bibles, turn there to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll put up the New King James translation, if, if that's a little bit different maybe than the words you're accustomed to. And let's, excuse me, let's follow. Therefore, I exert first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who enter authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle, I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Now, Paul begins, the the purpose of this prayer is to encourage prayer for an orderly society in which the gospel will be able to reach everyone. This is a wonderful prayer that every person living anywhere in the world can ask God for. The churches around the world should be praying for this. We are, in order for the gospel to gain a response that we would like for it to, there are several things are necessary or or, are ideal that would be good and best if that were the case. Uh, Another way of saying is what circumstances move the gospel forward. And so he tells us, 
Paul, and, and, and I know you're recognizing this intuitively or even subconsciously. In this letter, Paul keeps going from, from one position to another. I mean, in his communication, he, he urges Timothy on the one hand, like, a, like the, the, uh, um, the father, Paul, urging his son to do what he needs to do. But then there's also this commanding side of Paul, the apostle side of Paul, who has every right to just make commands. He is an apostle. He's recognized. He has apostolic authority. He can come in and just order the church around. But, but he, he, he resists that. We see some of it. And then we see Paul urging his son in the faith, urging this church to do these things that they know to be right. Therefore, he says, I exhort first of all, and that's first in importance for all of our prayer warriors here today. They rejoice in that. Paul agrees with them that prayer is the lifeblood of the church. And Paul uses four words for prayer. I don't know if you pick them all up there in verse 1 or not, but four types, if you will, of prayer to show the breadth of prayer. The first one, he says, is uh, in order of importance is prayer. He says Paul, um, to, he used those four words to just show the, the breadth. A prayer is more than us just asking God for what we want. It's more than that. And you, you know this from, from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. Uh, Philippians 4, 6 it is, where Paul brings up these same four. He says, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Those same four things, a part of our prayer life, should be a part of who we are and, and how we approach the Lord. He begins with that first word, supplications. Or in my translation, yours may be request. These are desires that are focused on particulars. Probably every one of us for the last week or more have prayed for hurricane victims. Whether we were watching the television, whether we got a call from a relative, whether we know somebody there and we're checking up on them, we don't know where they are. We have, we have prayed supplications. We've asked God for someone else. We've asked God to do something for someone else. And then the second word is just a general word for prayers. It's kind of an umbrella word for all of it. The third word he uses is intercessions, interceding on someone's behalf. If you were here last Sunday, you know that we sent Mark Skelton, uh, or Mark chose to go. We don't send anybody. Uh, we, we join them in our hearts as they do what they, God tells them to do. But Mark Skelton left, left last Sunday, uh, and we, we did know a Sue Ella Baird also went with that same group. So two church members from our church were there and are there, and they have been serving. So when we intercede, we pray for Mark and we pray for Suella. Lord, give them strength, keep them free from germs, keep them free from injury, Lord, give them hearts to share the gospel and, and be willing to do whatever they're asked to do. May they be our ambassadors for Christ. We pray for others, particularly on their behalf. And then uh, I told you, you know, what one person has said, thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring, for grace and power are such, none can ever ask too much. And I think we learned that this morning as well in our Bible study thing. You know, you, you, our God is an omnipotent God. There is nothing he's not capable of doing. But sometimes we pray these little beggarly, weeny prayers, right? I mean, when I think God would like us to come boldly into the throne of grace in our hour of need and say, Lord, we pray for all the men and women that are in Florida, friend and foe alike. Our hearts go out to people who are in the face of disaster and all that's going to transpire in the days and hours, weeks to come. Father, we, we're concerned for them. Lives are going to be altered in, in one great way or another. And so we come and we intercede for them. We pray for them and we ask for a lot. The fourth word he uses is giving of thanks for all men, for the king and for all who are in authority. Now, I know none of y'all oohed and awed when I read that part of the verse, but let me tell you, these are remarkable concepts at the day they were written. When Paul wrote these words, people like Nero were, were on the throne of Rome, emperors. And he tells them to pray for them. 
Now, I don't know how many Christians inherently pray for people like Nero. It seems to me to be a, a minority for sure. And he uses the word plural for kings here, meaning he's talking about the likes of Nero and everybody else. Every sheriff's got a town. There's authorities everywhere, small local guys, all the way up to the imperial people. And Paul says all of them you need to be including in your prayers. Some of them you may know personally. Some of them are in your town. Some of them you may be worried about. And Paul says that we need to give thanks for them and for the role that God has given them to play. The church brought her persecutors before the throne of grace. I tell you, that's one of the most remarkable things I think in human history. That the person who would like to kill me, if they could identify me and find me, burn me to death or nail me to a cross, I pray for them. Sincerely and truly. And I, I don't have time to, I'd love to just go off that direction for a while and talk to you about what happens in your heart when you pray for somebody that's the last person you care about, right? Or maybe the first person you'd like to hear is dead, right? Instead of praying for their death, the, the Apostle Paul would tell us to give thanks for them. You know, when you pray for somebody you don't like, I, I don't know all that God does. I mean, truly, uh, there were some believers praying for Saul of Tarsus when he's putting their friends in jails for being Christian, right? Somebody was praying for him. I don't know who it was, but there were people, a few people who did that. And, and, and who would have even thought that God would have answered that prayer? This man was single-handedly the death warrant of the early church. And, and here, look what God does. And so... It's good not only to pray because God may answer those prayers for them, but the, the, the equally great miracle there is what God does on your heart. It's pretty hard to be mean and ugly to somebody you're regularly praying for, saying, God, I pray for them. I, I don't get why they're like they are. I don't understand why they're persecuting me. I don't know why they singled me out and they hate me, you know. Lord, I don't get it, but I pray for them. Maybe there's things I don't know, and, 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 and if I knew them, I might understand better. But it does a work in your heart. It's pretty tough to, be, um, to stop being a spirit-filled Christian, right? You continue to, pr to pray and lift up the Lord um, in, in their life, and you never know what God is going to do. So I would also say it is extraordinary to trace how all throughout the days of the early church, those days of bitter persecution, the church still regarded it as an absolute duty to pray for the emperor and the subordinate kings and governors. It was their duty. It wasn't their pleasure. It was their duty. That's what we do. Did you know that Peter, in his first letter, said that we, they were to honor the emperor? And at that time, it was Nero. So, and, and another church father by the name of Tertullian insisted that for the emperor, the Christians should pray, and this is the quote. This is a church father teaching fellow believers what they need to pray for the emperor. This is what he said. Pray for long life. That's probably the last thing you're thinking about. You're praying for a short heart attack and, and be over with, you know. The Lord says, no, you pray for them to have long life, secure dominion. That's probably the second thing you pray. Lord, get them out of that office, you know. Hang them, find something out, get, get them. He said, no, you pray for their long dominion. He says, a, a safe home a faithful senate, a righteous people, and a world at peace. That's what one of our church fathers taught other believers to pray. And I'll tell you another good one. In 311 AD, the Roman emperor Galerius actually asked for the prayers of Christians. And he promised them mercy and indulgence if they prayed for the Roman state. The object of these prayers he says it's everyone. You know, Judaism has a long history of praying for leaders. God taught his people early on, you lift up those that, that I've placed over you. The good and the bad alike, you pray for them. Um, you know, while their salvation is obviously the number one thing we pray for anyone and for everyone, this prayer is wider than that church. You evangelicals don't quit at just praying for the salvation of the world. I mean, that, there's nothing wrong with that being your first and foremost prayer, but Paul is teaching us a broader kind of praying here than just that. Leaders who are above it, they need knowledge. They need wisdom. They need good counselors. They need 
good mentors. There's a lot of things we can pray so that they have better knowledge to do a better job in the responsibility God's given to them. We, we need freedom from anarchy. We need freedom from persecution. We need freedom from economic hardship so the gospel can spread. Paul says in verse 2 that we may lead a quiet and peaceable, peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Now, Paul's not saying, you know, Lord, just give us peace, you know, for all of us believers. His goal and all-consuming passion is that the gospel might freely penetrate society, which will be done most effectively in a peaceful context. When there is peace and the gospel can be shared without impunity, then it's a wonderful thing, which is what we generally have and have had in this land since our birth. And then Paul says the manner he wants us to do that is with godliness and with reverence. And by the way, even the non-Christian world of, of Timothy's day was aware of these terms as like being religious terms and being dignity terms, that, that it's good for people to be godly and reverent, even though they didn't really understand what it meant. They knew it was a good thing for people to behave and to be that way. They meant having a good reputation in the world. The lives of Christians should affirm to onlookers the validity and attractiveness of the gospel. We ought to be, church, among the most attractive people in all the world. I'm obviously not talking about physically, but by our winsomeness, by being filled with the Spirit of God, the forgiving, loving nature of Christ that dwells in us, we are His hands and we are His feet. We are His mouth. His, and as we move like Christ moved, we will see much of what happened in Christ's life happen in our life. As God uses it, we forgive co-workers. We're gracious. We, we turn the other cheek. We seek peace. These are very winsome characteristics that no matter who you are, it's a blessing to have that person in your cubicle or, or on your uh, route or a part of your clientele or someone you go and see. And that's exactly where Paul is going with all of this. Paul told the Thessalonians, he said, live a quiet life in such a way as to win the respect of unbelievers. Your neighbors ought to respect you. May not like you or anything else, but there ought to be respect there because of the way you are with them, the way you treat them. They're valued and glad to have you as someone in their life, an important person, geographically in their world. As the world sees the Christian character of believers, not only will the gospel move forward in a very orderly and peaceful society, but it's also going to be recognized as genuine for what it really is. Furthermore, he says in verse 3, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Prayer pleases God, if you've not been told that recently. Now, you might not know that by the size of our prayer meeting on Wednesday night. To our church's shame that they're in a small classroom. To our shame, we're in a small classroom. If you say, I believe prayer pleases God, the, the American will answer that. Oh, I can pray anytime, anywhere. And that's 100% biblical. But you also probably know little about the power of a prayer meeting little of what God does when two or three gather in His name. You can stand out there on your bicycle and ride around praying, but when two or three people gather together and they bow their heads and they come together, the Holy Spirit takes over that meeting and He does as He chooses. And things are prayed that no one planned on praying. God leads in directions that no one knew there were even needs there. Things happen in a prayer meeting they don't happen anywhere else. They don't happen in a Bible study. They don't happen in the corporate worship time. They don't happen in committee meetings, generally speaking. Amazing times with God. Unforgettable times with God. You want an encounter with God, you ought to come to the prayer meeting. Humble people. Regular people. They're not showing off how, how verbose they are or how, how eloquent they are. That We just stumble through names you give us. Situations we know. And together we just do our best to cover this breadth of prayer that, that uh, Paul is talking to Timothy about, these important things. You know, in Paul's life, he had his share of riots, and he also had his share of revivals. He knew 
tough times, well, as a matter of fact, in Ephesus, when there was a big riot there, 20,000 people packed into that, that amphitheater and would like to have had his head. And he was more than happy to go into them and tell them what for, you know. Uh, and fortunately, some brothers kept him from doing that, and he lived to, to preach another day. And he also knew revivals. He also saw men and women come to faith in Christ. He watched it and witnessed it for himself. He saw these churches get planted and grow for decades and bring fruit to Christ and to the kingdom. The world and its governments are the arena of God's activity. That's why we pray for our state congressmen, our senators. That's why we pray for our local representatives. That's why we pray for the Glendale uh, uh, City Council. That's why we're grateful for the uh, public servants, those who have authority in our lives and who do so much good and are rarely thanked and are rarely appreciated. And while it's true, it is true that the gospel will flourish under tyranny. I mean, hear me say that. We're not praying for peace because we're scared of tyranny. The truth is the church does very well under persecution and under tyranny. The, the underground church seems to take off, as it is in many parts of our world today. The underground church is enormous. In some places, we can't keep up with it for what it's doing. So I know that. I understand that. Apostle Paul says, however, ideal circumstances are we have religious freedom and religious uh, free speech so that we're able to stand out in the marketplace on street corners and gather in people's homes and together share what Christ means to us and study God's Word together. In verse 4, he says, God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. You know, God doesn't shut anybody out from His kingdom of heaven. God says, I want everyone to be saved. I want everyone, whoever they are, wherever they are, even the likes of a Saul of Tarsus, I want them in my kingdom. Salvation is the active work of God who has compassion and He has strength to rescue us. The truth is to be grasped appropriated and allowed to change, metamorphosize our life and change us. The fact that God desires the salvation of all people, however, does not guarantee that all people are going to be saved. God will not override the reluctance or opposition of individuals bent upon pursuing their own way of defiance of God. What God delights in may not be done by disobedient people. You know disobedient people who are resisting His gift of salvation. You know people who say, I will not let God be in my life, much less run my life. And God urges us to repentance with His goodness. He's kind to us even while we are mean to Him. He loves us even though we don't love Him. In verse 6, there's only one mediator. He says, both Old and New Testaments of the Bible show this need for mediation. Job knew it. The old one, arguably the oldest book in the Bible. Job knew that God was holy and that people were sinful and they needed an umpire, an umpire to somebody who could be a representative for both parties, somebody who could, who could represent a holy God because who, who, what sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God? We can't. We can't have access. But would that there would be a mediator, somebody who heaven would approve of, and then somebody that earth could see and understand. What if there could be some kind of mediator, God-man, slash half-divine, half-human, and that together he could be our representative. He would understand the, the condition we're in, and, and he also understands God's position. Oh, that there would be a mediator, a daysman is the word that Job used, that could somehow work this whole thing out. And God in His infinite wisdom knew it, and He gave it to us. He gave us a prophet, priest, and king in our Lord Jesus Christ. And especially in that priestly role, being both divine and human, offering Himself as a sacrifice, He is the only true mediator. He gave Himself, He says in this verse, a ransom, a substitute, an atoning substitute. Uh, a ransom is simply the money paid to buy back a captive of a warfare, someone caught up as spoils of war. They are purchased back by someone else. Jesus' death is the price that God paid for the release of humankind from captivity to sin. 
Even in that letter of Ephesians we just looked at recently, Paul wrote, Christ gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. There on the cross, Christ paid the debt that we owe. And then he says in verse 7 um, that uh, he has three offices. He's a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. And his job is to proclaim Jesus to the world. As a preacher, he has simply announcements to make, the message from the Lord. Secondly, as apostle, he was, had a responsibility. He had a commission. And then thirdly, as the teacher to the Gentiles, to teach them. The gospel for all people in all cultures. God takes no pleasure in people dying without salvation. C.T. Studd, you may have read his biography. He was a great student missionary to China, then he went to India, and then he went to Africa. And he used to say this over and over again when people would talk to him. He'd say, you know, some people want to live within the sound of church bells. He said, you know, I want to run a rescue shop within a yard of hell. Stand right at hell's gates. And before they leave this place, saved yet so as by fire, reach in and snatch them before hell has the final victory. We have a couple in our church who believes that. Uh, just they, I talked to them last Sunday as they'd made plans for yesterday. They, they went to a city park, determined that they wanted to share the Christ with people in the park on a Saturday, and that's what they did. They thought of some ideas and put them together, and they went to the park yesterday. And they called me or texted me or something, asked me to pray for them. And I thought, what a high privilege. And they went and they shared Christ, and I just got the report this morning that that one lady was led to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you believe that, church, you have to do something. We have to act on it. We, have, we ought to have a list of lost people we're praying for, wherever they are in the world or wherever they are in our life. We ought to be praying for them. In today's world of pluralism, pluralism says that all religions are, have value. All of these things have value. None of them have exclusive ownership of the truth. There's a little bit of truth in all of them. That's what you hear out among, among especially the younger people in our world today. And, and it is a concern to us, church, that we not alienate people um, or any more than we have to. We should accommodate and be winsome, wonderful people. Win them over to Christ by our characteristics. At some point, we speak the truth in love. And at some point, the truth is what it is. We can't amend the truth or, or change the truth. Without weakness or compromise, we must declare the narrow way. But in doing so, we can stress that there is a way. There's a wonderful way. It's called the gospel good news. You on Galilee, it's the good news. We, you have good news for people, you know? Uh, and, and, and we should approach it that way. It's important that we show that. Our message is not a gloom and doom message, but it's a, a way that's been opened by a mediator. There's one person a God-man, who the, the Son of God who made possible the way. And it's incumbent upon you and me, each of us, that within our range of human relationships that we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says we're not to, uh, that we're not only to pray for everybody, but we should realize that God wants to save everybody. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have privileged information that you shared through the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith, Timothy. And Father, we thank you for this man's heart for lost people. He truly modeled for us what a, what a missionary preacher apostle looks like. And Father God, we, we never feel we can measure up to the likes of an Apostle Paul but Father, we do love you, and we know what you've done in our life. We're experts in that subject matter. And Father, with others who we win by being Christ-like, can share and earn a place at the table to tell of the great things that God has done. Father, let us not lose the edge, the love, the passion, the desire 
to see more people join us, Lord, even in this, this small church, Lord, here, that more would come here and find forgiveness and a love that goes beyond anything they've ever seen or experienced in you and even in the church body. Father, we'll be careful to give you all the glory and all the praise. Lord, now if there's anybody here that needs to join this great church or, or be baptized or pray to receive Christ, Father, it would be our thrill and our pleasure to pray with them. In the great name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. If you'd like to, you can stand with me. Derek's going to lead us. If you'd like to sing, you can sing. You're welcome to pray here at the front if you'd like. Or if I can be of help, Steve's here. We'd be happy to talk to you.
Lord, whether that be in Florida or whether it be Texas or Louisiana or in any other place in this nation and in our community too today, Lord, help us to be quick to step forward as you call us to serve you. Lord, we ask that you would be glorified in all these things, that your great name would be raised up in this nation, and that our nation would learn to trust in you, the one true living God and the only Savior of this world. It's in Jesus' name.